Dan's an idiot. Ollie's grumpy. I love science! Nikki's cute. <laughs> Mike's bad. <laughs> and Kirby's a clown. I'm in the corner! They are the guinea pigs, five of the most stupid people in the universe. <laughs> and this is Professor Stuart Milligan. Now who says physics is boring? One of the cleverest. And he's going to push the boys physically and mentally to the absolute limits of stupidity. <laughs> all in the pursuit of science. Imagine you're a cow. Hooray for science! <laughs> Coming up in tonight's experiments, Kirby swallows a load for the team in Boy v Girl. High times for the professor, low times for the boys. And is it possible to get drunk without drinking alcohol? Get me a drink. <laughs> but before we get to that, it's time for the first experiment. A salmon trout a barracuda, and two turbot. <laughs> Welcome to fish slapping. Fresh. In this experiment, the guinea pigs will be using the fish to simulate one of life's everyday dangers. For example, when we're crossing the road. That's right, we're looking at peripheral vision. Representing the car are these fish, Representing the pedestrian is Dan's face. Come on, guys! <laughs> Did you see it? Just one thing, Professor. What is peripheral vision? According to Webster's Medical Dictionary, peripheral vision is the ability to see objects and movement outside the direct line of vision. I.e., if I was looking directly ahead and somebody was to appear on my right here, they would be in my peripheral vision, which means he would look like this. Yet when I turn to face him, he looks perfectly normal. My eyes. Apart from his lack of skin. Which is where Dan and the fish come in. If Dan's peripheral vision is any good, he should be able to avoid the oncoming tsunami of flying fish. Oh. <laughs> 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 I love the smell of fish. Right, now you go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, it's not looking good for Dan. For the next part of the experiment, we're going to reduce Dan's peripheral vision by taping up the sides of his goggles. The more tape we apply, the less light that can enter from the side. This reduces his peripheral vision, making it harder for him to see the fish flying towards him. <laughs> Dan, you've got to like, sit forward and actually take it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I ripped my nose or something with brain so I can get off this stool and it be the end. <laughs> the final part of the experiment is to recreate what is commonly referred to as tunnel vision. There. <laughs> That's when I can see it. As we can see, Dan has no peripheral vision whatsoever. No prizes for guessing the results of this part of the experiment. There we are. Go on, hit me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How much space to dodge? Fishy <laughs> <laughs> pig. So what have we learned? Well, according to our data, Dan had pretty poor peripheral vision right from the beginning. But this is probably because the fish were coming from behind rather than from the side. So let's be honest, he didn't stand much of a chance. <laughs> that was a 10 out of 10 experiment, I think. Yeah, thumbs up for that one. We all know if drunk to excess, alcohol is very bad for your health. It rots your liver and kills your brain cells. But what if it was possible to get drunk without drinking alcohol? Best experiment of 
with this cereal. Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Each pig will have a different kind of drink. Ollie is drinking cocktails because he'll put anything in his mouth. That's a white Russian, a mixture of milk, vodka, and coffee liqueur. Blew. Mike is drinking wine because he has the nose for it. Kirby is champagne because he's effervescent. Nick is mixing his because we told him to. Obviously, drinking this much is a very bad idea. But Dan? Dan is drinking a placebo. No, it's not a girly cocktail. A placebo is something that looks and tastes like the real thing, but doesn't have any effects. Dan thinks he's drinking a run-of-the-mill beer. In fact, it's non-alcoholic, because I want to find out if it's possible to get drunk without being intoxicated. Where's the drink? Where's the drink? Where's the drink? Where's the drink? Mmm, <laughs> this could get ugly. Uh, I don't have a beard. Oh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> cheers. Oh, nice food, man. Nicky looks considerably worse for wear compared to all the others. I wonder why. That's point number three down. Nicky hasn't eaten all day. His stomach is empty. He's drunk. If you drink on an empty stomach, it goes straight through and is quickly absorbed into the body <laughs> via the small intestine. I can handle this juice. This is my sponge brain grid. It charts the seven stages of alcohol's effect on personality and bodily functions. Stage one is the beginning of the night. Your first drink. You feel relaxed. But even now, your alertness has been impaired. Stage two is emotional arousal. You're starting to talk louder. You're a little bit more excitable. But your coordination is not quite what it should be. Stage three. Some people get very happy, some very sad. Your sense of judgment will have got a taxi home half an hour ago and your vision is getting its coat. Oi, me again! <laughs> Moving quickly through the emotional instability and physical consequences of stage four, we get to stage five, stupor. Your balance and coordination is gone and your speech is slurred. You really should have stopped and gone to bed hours ago. Now, if you insist on drinking any more, you will soon find yourself at stage six, unconsciousness. At this stage, you can expect to lose complete control of everything, including your bladder and bowels. But that's the least of your worries, because straight after that, you get respiratory arrest and you die. Needless to say, we've made sure the boys stay low down on the professor's grid. But there's no denying that they're all, to a man, smashed. <laughs> Three sheets to the wind and two steps from bowing down to the porcelain god. They are drunk. I'm sober! Most interesting is Dan, who's been drinking a placebo without a spot of alcohol in it all night. Don't believe us? Listen to this. I want to be able to have a job to do with art. I mean, my girlfriend wants four, five kids, but she bought me a teddy bear and called it Norman because I wanted to name my boy Norman. Boys are so much better on their own. And girls need comfort and stuff. No, Dan, Dan, now talk a bit of crap, right? <laughs> Stop with the information, just talk a bit of crap. The placebo has worked. How? Simple, really. All night long, what there is of Dan's brain has believed that it's been taking in alcohol and knows what to expect. Couple that with the general atmosphere of the other drunk guinea pigs, and Dan behaves accordingly. So it is possible to get drunk without drinking. <laughs> I'm drunk. <laughs> Look, it's a room full of balloons, and the balloons are full of gas, because we want to find out what's the world's funniest gas. Dear guinea pigs, welcome to the magical guinea pig balloon forest. Hidden somewhere inside you'll find the punchline to the world's funniest joke. What do you call a guinea pig with three eyes? Happy hunting. For something you can't normally see, gases can be comical. Just think of one of the funniest sounds known to man. 
a methane-loaded eruption of flatulence, or as you may know it, a fart. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> These balloons each contain a different type of gas, helium, nitrous oxide and oxygen. But which of them is the funniest and why? And what is the punchline to the world's funniest joke? To find out, the boys will have to breathe the gas from each balloon. <laughs> Kirby's balloon is full of oxygen. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that oxygen is very important. If we can't breathe it, we die. Very important, but not very funny. Helium, though, is quite amusing. Why? Because it makes a sound like this. I want to be big. <laughs> Helium is much lighter than air. And it makes my vocal cords vibrate faster, changing the sound. And that's quite funny. <laughs> But inhaling too much helium is no laughing matter, so don't try this at home. However, the reason the boys are laughing so much is because they're breathing in nitrous oxide, otherwise known as laughing gas. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about nitrous oxide is funny. Unlike oxygen and helium, it's a manufactured gas invented by a priest named Priestley, who upon making it said, I have now discovered air five or six times as good as common air. Hello. Which is a very posh way of saying, I'm smashed. <laughs> <laughs> but although it can make us laugh like a drain, no one knows exactly how it works, which must make it the funniest gas in the universe. So if nitrous oxide is the funniest gas in the world, what's the punchline to the world's funniest joke? Actually, that is quite funny. <laughs> Still to come on guinea pigs, spit or swallow its brain freeze in Boy V Girl. Plus, the pigs try to defy the laws of gravity. <laughs> Welcome back to Guinea Pigs, the show where this professor finds science in every dumb thing these stupid boys do. Still to come, finally, Galileo's balls drop into the pigs' lives. <laughs> Hi, boys and girls. Welcome to Boy V Girl. We have Kirby against the lovely Izzy, who is our special guest today, and the girl. And today's one is all about brain freeze. The first one to get from three cups worth of slushy is the winner. And to make this a little bit more interesting, we have funnel, so you really have to chug these back. For those of you who speak English, Dan was trying to say that the object of this was to drink three cups of slushy as fast as possible. While they do this one simple task, I can tell you why we get brain freeze. We all love Kirby. His fuzzy ginger hair, terrible jokes. Need to come out the closet about something. And his bell. <laughs> but really, this is no way to meet a girl. OK, guys, are we ready? Yeah! Are we ready? Are we ready? <laughs> Mark, is that some chemistry I do detect? <laughs> chug! Chug, 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 chug. <laughs> Hold it back, hold it back. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on! But why is it that cold in the mouth equals pain in the head? It's probably an example of so-called referred pain, where the pain is really in one place, but you seem to feel it somewhere else. When slush enters the mouth, the cold causes changes in the blood vessels. But the large numbers of nerves in the mouth mix up the signals, and the pain can be felt here, here, anywhere. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on. Don't panic. Kirby isn't having a heart attack. The reason he and Izzy are using funnels is to illustrate what happens when the ice bypasses the mouth and goes straight to the chest. 
The body still reacts by sending blood there to warm it up, but this time the pain isn't referred anywhere else. Run, go! Come on, Kerbs! Oh, oh, Scott Charles! Okay. Well, having a bit of feedback. Come on. Uh, uh, right, nice. Kerbs! Come on! Oh, Kerbs! Come on! 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 Kerbs! And once again, the guinea pigs let the male of the species down. They really are useless, aren't they? Oh, no, the girls again. Let's the team down again. Yeah. We do. <laughs> we do. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the solution to this icy problem? Oh. Eat cold foods slowly. Sorry, guys. That's pathetic. <laughs> That's really bad. Show's about to start. Italy, the 16th century, Pisa. No Pisa, you idiot. And a fella called Galileo is about to change the world by playing with his balls. Ooh, military. Prior to this moment, everyone thought that if you dropped a heavy object from a fixed point, it would drop faster than a lighter one. Why? Because an ancient Greek guy called Aristotle told them so chumps. Galileo, on the other hand, Aha. reasoned that the gravitational pull of the Earth would cause all objects to fall at the same rate. To prove his point, he dropped his balls from a pre-leaning Tower of Pisa. And lo, it was so. But that was over 400 years ago, before the advent of TV science programmes. So we're going to put Galileo's theories to the test by getting Big boned 108 kilo Ollie and the 70 kilo lightweights Nicky and Kirby to jump off this 10 metre diving board. These are the Olympic diving boards at Crystal Palace in South London. This is the highest diving board in the southeast of England. I'm Chris Snowd, I'm former world diving champion, and I'm your high diving safety coordinator for today. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is see if we can get you to jump off the top board. Before former world champion diver Chris Snowd can take the boys up to the top board, he's instructed them to have a belly flop competition so they understand the potential dangers of hitting the water the wrong way. And you keep smiling as long as possible as you have the impact on your stomach. Belly flops hurt because the surface tension of water acts like an elastic sheet. A dive slices through the surface and breaks the tension. Land on your belly and you smack into a whole lot of pain. Peter Kay came down to do his one. Oh, time. everything stings. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Now, if you think that hurt, and believe me, it really did, just imagine how much worse it would have been from 10 metres, when he'd be travelling at 60 kilometres per hour. Or from 50 metres, when he'd be doing 80. And if he did this off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, he'd be travelling at 125 kilometres per hour. Which is why, of the 1,300 people that have jumped off the bridge, the only 20 to survive all landed vertically, feet first. Back to the experiment where we find Galileo's reputation in the hands of these three fearless idiots. Daniel. Will they all fall at the same speed? Standing near the edge, the whole, the whole of this wobbles. Shut especially, up, when, shut especially when Ollie's on it. When you get over the edge there, you start thinking, geez, if I fall to the side or something, things could go pretty badly. I have to admit, looking at Ollie, You'd think he would fall faster than Kirby and Nicky. Ready, steady, go! Yeah. Oh, Nicky hit the water at 1.5 seconds. So did Ollie. Fly, King, fly. And so did Kirby. So Galileo was telling the truth. All objects do fall at the same rate. And if you don't believe me, take a look at this. And these rules of gravity are universal. Commander David Scott of Apollo 15 carried out the same test on the moon. 
where there's no air resistance by dropping a hammer and a feather at the same time. Both fell at exactly the same speed and hit the moon's surface at the same time. Kirby and Nikki wanted to go to the moon, but the channel couldn't afford it. So instead, in a new experiment, they're going to employ air resistance, courtesy of several household items, to see if they slow down. I've got my umbrella here to uh, slow down my approach towards the water, because hopefully it should act like a parachute, and we shall see. Jump, jump, jump! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <It didn't work. laughs> Alright, this is a this is a little contraption to help me uh, to help me to slow my fall to the water. We're uh, we're gonna test it to see if it slows me down and um if it stays together it'll be all good. No, no. <laughs> well, that's worse than the umbrella! <laughs> turns out they've stolen my bed sheet and this is a proper parachute apparently, I've been told. Kirby's cut a hole in his bed sheet, so he won't get caught up in any sudden gusts of wind and miss the pool. Don't hold your breath. Kirby! Kirby! Go on! Go on, Kirby! <laughs> Nothing happened with that. Might help if we opened it next time. Well done, Kirby. By holding your nose, you failed to open your chute. You stupid boy. Which leaves Nicky and a paddling pool to save the pig's honour. As you can see, the large surface area of the paddling pool increases the drag and slows Nicky down by almost half a second. The exact same principle as a parachute. Hooray for science!